about the surface subgroup theorem and the error question. Okay. Yeah, so I've given these slides many times. Um, if you've seen it many times before, you should feel free to sleep through it. But there will be a few new slides at the end, more specifically about the iron price conjecture and the theory needed to prove the iron price conjecture. So, uh, and again, this is joint work with Ladder and Mortgage. So, well, the first theorem, which is known as the iron price conjecture, is if given two hyperbolic surfaces, S and T closed hyperbolic surfaces, then they have nearby finite covers. Or a little more precisely, given some k greater than 1, we can find finite covers in a smooth quasi-conformal map between the finite covers. And of course, by k quasi-conformal, I just mean we can make it smooth and just say that in the tangent space, uh, ellipses, circles map to ellipses that are nearly circular. This k is close to All right, and then the second theorem says if we have a closed hyperbolic three manifold, then its fundamental group has a service of group. And you know, the reference is this actually has appeared in Annals of Mathematics, and the second one has finally been submitted. Okay, so here's just a brief model of how the two are going to be related. But to prove Aaron Price, we're going to take some model surface. I'll take the stick. To prove Aaron Price, we're going to take some model surface, and given any surface, we're going to find a cover of the model surface and a good immersion, so a nearly isometric immersion of this cover to the surface. And of course, an immersion of a closed surface to a closed surface is a cover. And in three dimensions, we're given a three manifold. We're going to take the exact same model surface, find a finite cover, and a nearly isometric immersion. So from this point of view, they're almost the same theorem. And OK, so before we build covers of a surface, let me briefly talk about building covers of a circle. So here I have segments, and I join them together to form a degree two cover of the circle. Likewise, I can join these together. So these segments, they're not embedded. They're just immersed as they go more than once around. And they form a degree four cover when I put them together of the circle. So we can join immersed one manifolds with boundary to form a cover of a closed one manifold. And more generally, we can join immersed orientable n manifolds with boundary to form a cover of a closed orientable n manifold. OK. And we can possibly build more than one cover. Here we have like three factorial ways of joining these three to these three, and likewise two factorial there. And if we don't have kind of the right number on both sides, we can fail to build a cover. Here's, there's two on one side, one on the other, and so forth. So when can we build a cover? So if we have a collection of these segments, we can just form a kind of boundary where we take the ones, the number of ones on the right minus the number of ones on the left. And here the boundary is zero, here the boundary is zero, here boundary is not zero. I guess actually I'm taking number of ones, yeah, on the right minus number of ones on the left, and here you have to turn your head upside down and you get one minus two is minus one. So there's a formal boundary operation that takes sums of immersed segments to formal sums of points. And we need the boundary to be 0 in order to be able to join together the segments to form a cover. All right, so let's look at one manifold to immerse in a two manifold. This is kind of one dimension lower than the surface subgroup theorem. So here I have these one dimensional segments, like GD6 segments, I mapped into a surface. And we can always put these together to form an immersed one manifold by kind of taking two copies of each of these guys. We have like three guys coming in, but we can take two copies oriented in opposite directions and always connect one coming in to one going out. And then we form the closed uh, piecewise geodesic immersed one manifold. And even if we have an even number coming in, we still, of course, have two copies of each. And similar here. And now, 
let's look at the things, imagine things are coming in from every direction. We say that a set of points on the circle is evenly distributed. If you look at every kind of epsilon interval, if you have nearly the same number of points in every two epsilon intervals. So here, the ratio should be controlled by 1 plus epsilon. And we say it's evenly distributed to the scale epsilon. So epsilon controls both the size of the interval and the tolerance of the ratio. And now, if these guys are coming in in such a way that, say, the tangent vectors around the circle are evenly distributed, then when we fit them together and we pair each of these up, we have a very small bending angle for the geodesics. And so we've made something nearly geodesic. And we've made a piecewise immersed one manifold that's nearly geodesic. And one application of this is that if you have some control on the length of the segments and lower bound on the length of the segments, and you say that these bending angles are small, then you've made something that's homotopically non-trivial. Right? You've made a non-trivial element of the uh, free homotopy. Classes. Okay, so now let's go back up to two dimensions, and I'm sure you all know what a pair of pants is. And of course, we can make a surface out of these pairs of pants. So we're going to make hyperbolic surfaces out of pairs of pants. We're going to make covers eventually out of pairs of pants. But let's just look how we study the geometry of a hyperbolic surface in terms. This is what I'm going to call a panted hyperbolic surface. It's a surface divided into pairs of pants. And we want to understand the geometry of the surface in terms of the geometry of the pants and how they fit together. So a hyperbolic pair of pants, you can make it by doubling a right-angled hyperbolic hexagon over three sides. You double over this side, this side, and this side, and you get something looking like this. And it's going to have three half lengths, L1, L2, and L3, which are the three lengths of alternating sides on the hexagon. And we want to measure how we fit the pants together. So here we have two adjacent pairs of pants. And if we look at the universal cover of this curved gamma, then we see so there's some sine distance s of gamma between the one on the right and the one on the left. So we have this kind of seam of the pair of pants, this common orthogonal between these two cups of the pants and this common orthogonal. And then we have the sine distance s of gamma between the feet of this common orthogonal. And that's defined up to the half length of this pair of pants. Because from here to here is going to be halfway around that boundary of GDC. Okay. So that's the shear coordinate. And if I reverse the roles of this, if I turn this whole thing upside down, I'm going to get the same distance with the same sign. So for each gamma, I have a shear coordinate, which is the sine distance modulo the half length of that cuff. OK, so now I can define a perfect panted surface. So a perfect pair of pants is just one, and our perfect pair of pants, if you like, is just one where all three cups have length r. And a perfect panted surface is one not only where all pants are r perfect, but where all the shears are exactly equal to one. One's just a convenient number. And a simple theorem, relatively simple theorem, is any two closed perfect surfaces have a common finite cover. So given two perfect panted surfaces, if you just think of them as hyperbolic surfaces, they have a common finite cover. That's a relatively simple exercise. And we're not going to be able to make perfect panted surfaces as the cover of any given surface, but we can make, hope to make good panted surfaces. So a good pair of pants is one in which each boundary cup has half length with an epsilon of r. So this is a kind of r epsilon good pair of pants. And we want the shears to be with an epsilon over r of 1. So mnemonically, you sort of take this equation, divide by r. And you get an epsilon over r over here. And then the first kind of real theorem is that a good closed panted surface 
is close to a perfect surface. So given a good closed canted surface, you could make a kind of associated perfect surface by making all the half lengths exactly equal to r and all of the shears exactly equal to 1. And that's a perfect surface. And the theorem is that the good closed surface is close to the perfect surface. So yeah, to make this more precise, as long as epsilon is small and r is large, kind of universally, then any epsilon r good canted surface is going to be a trillion epsilon close to the associated r perfect surface in the type one metric. So you have a quasi conformal map with dilatation like one plus a trillion epsilon. And this picture is intended to give the idea of the theorem. So the point of shearing by one, like this picture, okay, this picture is meant, you take a panted surface and you look basically at the universal cover of our panted surface. So you take a good panted surface and you look at its universal cover. So these, these uh, cuffs, Right, the closed geodesics that you're using to divide the surface into pants, they're going to become these infinite geodesics. And then you have these shears by one. So what's important is when you have this kind of surface where these guys have length r, then this distance here is very small. It's like e to the minus r over 2. So there are places where these geodesics are coming very close together. But the places where they're coming together is kind of processing with a distance of 1. So if you take a unit length transversal to this picture, it's going to be pushed from the places where these geodesics are coming close together into the regions where they're far apart, like a bounded distance apart, like 1 over 10 or something. So what happens is that this unit length transversal can cross at most, say, 100 R of these shears. That's what it turns out to be. Yes, there are R. For some very simple reason. Um, well, it turns out, yeah, it can cross at most 100 R of these shears. And each of these shears can introduce, by, by, we're assuming that they're introducing an error of at most epsilon over r. So the kind of total accumulated error on a unit length transversal is less than epsilon. So we have a kind of small total accumulated error of shears on each unit length transversal. And then that translates to control on the type one distance. So control on the, the distortion. OK. So this sort of schematic picture is we're going to find a good cover. Given S and T, we'll find a good cover for S, like an R epsilon good cover, and a good cover for T. Then these good covers are close to perfect ones. The perfect ones have a common cover. So that means that the good ones have covers that are nearby. And that implies the iron crest. So we want to build these good covers. For each surface, we want to build these good covers. How are we going to build these good covers? So we can think of, we can look at a pair of pants, like a hyperbolic pair of pants, and think of it as being isometrically immersed into a surface. So here's a surface. Here's like one thick part of the pants. Here's the other thick part of the pants. And we can think of these pants as being isometrically immersed, and then say it's a good pair of pants if the lengths are within epsilon of r. If the cup half lengths are within epsilon of r. So again, the idea is that epsilon is given to you. You want two services to be close, so this epsilon is basically given to you. But then you want to take the r to be quite large so that you can kind of wrap things around in many different ways. So you can make many different kinds of pants. And then the idea, we want to make a cover out of these immersed pants. So it's like kind of the picture of building covers for a circle. 
If we have two pairs of pants that meet on opposite sides of the same cuff, then we can kind of glue them together in a parameterizing picture and get an immersion of a larger surface into our given surface. Okay? And if we could do this, well, the whole idea is if we have a finite collection of immersed pants, so maybe we have more than one of each immersed pair of pants, but if we have a finite set of these immersed pants in a hyperbolic surface S, such that for every closed adhesive gamma on S, we have the same number on both sides of the surface, then we can assemble this collection of pants to form a finite cover of the surface. Okay, so it's exactly analogous to what we did just forming covers of the circle. As long as we have the same number on both sides, we can pair them up actually arbitrarily and form a finite cover of our given closed surface. Okay? So the idea is to create such a set of pants and also assemble them in such a way to get a good panted surface. So let's consider the set of good pants and good curves. So we just look at all closed geodesics on our surface for which the half length of the closed geodesic is with an epsilon of r. So you just take the length of the closed geodesic, divide by 2, it should be with an epsilon of r. And then we also consider all immersed pairs of pants whose boundary is all good curves. You know, so the three boundary components are each good curves. And so then we have, um, that's our collection, this pi epsilon r is our collection of good pants. And two things to remember. The first is that we fix, we're given the surface S, and we're trying to make this epsilon r good cover of S, this good panted cover, this epsilon r good panted cover of S. So we fix S, we're kind of given S, and we're given epsilon as well. Like we're, you take the epsilon of the Aaron price and you just divide by a trillion, and you get the epsilon for how good our, we want our pants to be. And then we're going to take R to be quite large depending on S and epsilon. So that's a kind of standing assumption for what follows. Okay, and it's valuable to count this. This one's some, for some reason kind of cut off. But we want to count good pants and good curves. So the number of epsilon r good curves is about e to the 3r. So again, we think of epsilon as fixed. So these are like functions of r. And the number of good pairs of pants is about e to the 3r. And the number of good curves is like e to the 2r over r. So if you look at pants, the idea is if you have a good pair of pants, you have three connections here. You fix a point, like in one side and the other side, you form three connections. And each of these connections have length about r. And then you look at the number of possibilities of that connection, and it's about e to the r possibilities. So of course, for the three connections, we have about e to the three r possibilities. And then this is standard, but it follows from similar reasoning. And so, so what do you mean by e to the r possibilities? I mean, aren't there many? I mean, I mean, if you look at the number of, for example, GD6 segments of length about r connecting two points on the surface, oh, there's about e to the r. It's just a heuristic calculation, but it certainly works out. And so, the number of pairs of pants that have a given GD sickest boundary is on the order of R e to the R. And again, another way to look at it is if I have if I have a single GD sick like this, I have kind of R ways of choosing a pair of points nearly opposite on the GD sick. And then I'm looking at kind of third connections here, ways of connecting these pair of points by a segment of length about R. And that's what's going to give me a good pair of pants. So I have e to the r ways here, r ways of choosing that pair of points. So I have like r e to the r possibilities. 
Okay, so for the sake of stating the next kind of major result, um, let's take the square root of a geodesic. So the square root of a geodesic is just basically the set of pairs of opposite points on the geodesic. It's kind of like a square root. The length of the square root of the geodesic is half the length of the geodesic. It's the half length of the geodesic. And the, the value is that if I look at the seams, these two seams of a pair of pants, and I look at the feet of those seams, they're going to be op a pair of opposite points on the geodesic. So they're going to be a single point on the square root of the geodesic. And so I can think of the feet of this pair of pants on this geodesic as being a pair of unit normal vectors to the geodesic or a single unit normal vector for the square root of the geodesic, at least schematically. But really, it's just another notation for a pair of unit normal vectors at opposite points in the same direction. And then the point is that here's my shear coordinates, right? I have two pairs of pants fitting together, and I have a pair of feet here, and I have a pair of feet here. And this distance is the same as that distance. And that's the shear associated to that curve between these two pairs of pants. But I could also think of it as looking at, here I have the feet per Q at gamma, and here I have the feet per P at gamma. They're both single points on the square root of gamma. And then the distance between those two points is exactly the shear between P and Q at gamma. So it's just another way of thinking of it as the distance between a single point and a single point. Okay, and then our theorem is we take, we fix our surface and we look at a single good curve gamma, so it has half length close to R. Then we look at all the good pants, we look at all the good pants that has gamma as a boundary. And for each such pair of good pants, we look at the feet of this pair of pants on gamma. And this pair of feet lives in this kind of pair of opposite points, or unit vectors to pairs of opposite points. And the claim is that this is uniform, evenly distributed on this unit normal bundle to the scale e to the minus qr. So for r large here, that means that it's evenly distributed to a very small scale. So maybe... So right, here's gamma, and then we have like pairs of unit normal vectors in two places. And then I have square root of gamma, which has half the length. And that becomes a single unit normal vector. So if I look at this unit normal bundle for the square root of gamma, that's kind of isomorphic to uh, two copies of square root of gamma, right? One on the one unit normal vector is pointing outward and one of unit normal vectors pointing inward. Okay, so and I'm saying that on both of these copies, these feet are kind of evenly distributed. And it follows we have nearly the same number on both sides. Okay, and that's I mean this is a major this is the second kind of major kind of theorem that goes into the Aaron Price. Excuse, excuse me. Yes. I, I didn't get what, what, what the Q was. It's a function of S and epsilon. Q is just a function of S and epsilon. Um, yeah, I mean, the Q actually, it, it turns out to depend on the rate of mixing of the surface. So it actually just depends on like the, the leading, the minimum eigenvalue for the Laplace. Um, so, I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, uh, there's an implicit constant here, of course, like, so it should be C e to the minus qr, and the C depends on the surface. Q actually just depends on this rate of mixing on the surface. So, let me give some idea of why this equidistribution holds. So there's a kind of counting one. Suppose I have two little GD6 segments living on the surface S. So I should draw a proper picture of that. Here's the surface S, and here's a couple of segments. And then we want to connect these segments in some way. 
by something orthogonal at both sides. And we want to count the number of such connections with length in some little interval. So we think of r minus and r plus as being nearby, and r as being large, or r plus being large. And we can count the number of segments. It kind of grows exponentially in r plus. It depends linearly on a and b. And it has some error term that's kind of exponentially smaller than the number of such GDCs, provided a and b are not too small. Okay. So it's some count on the number of connections it's in the surface, the number of kind of orthogonal GDC connections between two little GDC segments. And this theorem is in turn proven using the mixing of the GDC flow. So this is a sort of fairly standard theorem in a way. And it's proven using the mixing of the GDC flow on the surface. And then the point is that if I want to count the sort of distribution of pairs of pants on this given GDSIC, for every pair of pants that has this GDSIC as boundary, I can look at the associated GDSIC connection from the boundary to itself within that pair of pants. So this picture here, gamma is immersed heavily in the surface, and the pair of pants is heavily immersed. But I just lift it up to a nice pair of pants and I get this GD6 segment. And if I can count the number of GD6 segments and how they're distributed around gamma, I can count the number of pairs of pants and how they're distributed. And then this foot here, it turns out it's just the midpoint of these two points. So if these pairs are evenly distributed, then these feet here, the official feet, are also evenly distributed. Okay. So that's our equidistribution theorem. And then all we need is one more thing, and we'd be able to build these good covers and prove the Aaron Price conjecture. So if there were exactly the same number of pairs of pants on both sides of each GDC gamma, then we'd be able to pair them off, as this picture indicates, in order to make a good cover. So the meaning of this picture is I have this GDC gamma and I have a whole lot of pants on one side and pants on the other side. And if I have this equidistribution of feet and the same number of pants on both sides, I can pair each pants on the outside with a pair of pants on the inside so that all of these shears are very close to one. And then having made this pairing, I've formed a cover. And it's a good panted cover of the surface. And if I can make a good panted cover, of every surface we've proven the Aaron price. So all we need to do, the only thing missing, is getting exactly the same number of pairs of pants on both sides. But on the other hand, just by the definition of equidistribution, which says that on any interval we have nearly the same number, whether this interval is inside or outside, that geodesic, it follows from equidistribution that there's nearly the same number of pants, the same number of good pants on either side of a good geodesic. So all we, we want exactly the same number of pants, and we have nearly the same number of pants on both sides. OK, so before we return to this question of how we get exactly the same number of pants, let's see why this is actually easier in three dimensions. So it's easier to prove surface subgroup theorem than Aaron Price. So suppose now we have a hyperbolic three manifold. And again, we look at a good geodesic and the sort of square root of its geodesic, and we look at this unit normal bundle. So we look at the unit normal bundle to a good geodesic, and now it's connected. In two dimensions, it has two components. But in three dimensions, it's connected. So we're going to use a version of this doubling trick that we did with like one-dimensional guys in a two-dimensional surface. We're going to use a version of this doubling trick to build a nearly geodesic immersed surface, which then, of course, is going to have pi 1 injected. It's going to be injective on pi 1. So let me go into a little bit more detail on this. OK, so here we think of these curves. Here's our kind of model pair of pants, this sort of topological model pair of pants. And I wanted to find a skew pair of pants. So it's going to be a map of kind of model pair of pants into the three manifold. 
and such that each of these boundary curves map to a closed GD circuit. And each of these kind of connecting segments map to a GD6 segment orthogonal to the corresponding closed GD6. So they become the kind of shortest connections in the suitable kind of homotopy class between these closed GD6. And then the rest of F, we have two remaining kind of hexagons, and F is free to be whatever it wants on those two remaining hexagons as long as it's continuous. So you could say that the skew pair of pants is made of wire on these parts and then cloth on the rest. It's just kind of suspended. And now we can say something about the geometry of a skew pair of pants. So first of all, if I take a geodesic here, um, I can think of my closed geodesic as having a half length. The half length now, should have made this clear, the half length of my closed geodesic is going to live in C mod 2 pi i z. Okay, so if I have a closed geodesic in a 3 manifold, it has, of course, a real length. But also, I can take parallel transport and follow a unit normal vector around. And it has some rotation amount that lives in, I guess, R mod 2 pi i. And that's the imaginary part. It's going to be this rotation amount. And then, if I have a pair of feet coming from another pair of pants, this pair of feet, it's going to live in, well, each, each of the feet is going to live in C mod 2 pi i z really plus, this should be the length of gamma times z. And if I look at the pair of feet, it's living in this unit normal bundle to the square root of gamma. So that's exactly the C mod 2 pi i z plus um, half length of gamma times z. So here I have 2 pi i because I don't know the rotation amount. And then it's just defined up to this half length of gamma. And that's describing what we have to do to get from, well, that's just describing this pair of points, this, this pair of unit vectors, <coughs> it's a single point in this torus here, in this complex torus. So I have a comparison between two and three dimensions. In two dimensions, this unit normal bundle for gamma, it's R mod length of gamma times Z, and then there are two components. Or I could think of it as non-zero real numbers modulo the cyclic group. And in three dimensions, I look at the unit normal bundle, and I can think of it as this complex torus, so it's connected, and it's the same as non-zero complex numbers modulo a cyclic group. So in one case, it has two components. In the other case, it's this torus that's connected. So. So again, my good picture is I have this closed geodesic in the three manifold now, and I have a collection of good pairs of pants in the three manifold. So um, a good pair, like a, a pair of pants, it has three boundary cuffs and then these three connections. And it's good in the sense that these cuffs have like half length close to R. And then it has these feet. So for every good pair of pants, it has a feet on every boundary cuff. And I can think of this foot as being a single point on this unit normal bundle for the square root of the geodesic. And then we have an equidistribution theorem for, a for pairs of pants, skew pairs of pants in a hyperbolic three manifold. And this equidistribution theorem says that these, are, that these feet are e to the minus qr evenly distributed as points on this complex torus. Okay, so we talked about being evenly distributed on a circle. You can kind of write down a similar definition for being evenly distributed on a kind of complex torus on this kind of two-dimensional manifold. And what's most important is if we apply any translation of the torus, and we're going to apply i pi plus 1 on this torus, we're going to get a set of points that look very similar to this set of points. Okay, so that we can kind of take this set of points, rotate it around, and it's going to be practically indistinguishable from our original set of points because it was evenly distributed to begin with. 
Okay, so now what we're doing, this is all an analogy to what we wanted to do in two dimensions. We have this collection of good pants. And at every closed geodesic, we have the collection of good pants. And we look at the collection of feet of these good pants. So that's this A gamma. So this collection of feet, you can think of it as points on this unit normal bundle. And you can apply this translation of i pi plus 1 to each of these points. But I'm saying we can also find a permutation of these feet that closely approximates this translation, say, to within epsilon over r. So what's happening here is that I have this collection of pants, and I can find a permutation of the set of pants so that every foot is mapped to 1 at distance about i pi plus 1. So what this means, of course, is that each foot, the i pi puts it on the other side of the geodesic, and then 1 is a shear by 1. Right? We want things, pants to fit together kind of with small bending and a shear of 1. And the point is that now we take two copies of each pair of pants. If you like, you could take the two orientations of each pair of pants. And then, so you have one set of pants, say, that give gamma one orientation, and another set of pants that give gamma the opposite orientation. And you can apply this permutation going forward to go from one set of pants to the other. And you can also apply the permutation going backward from the other set of pants to the first. And the result is an involution. I mean, whenever you take a permutation, then you can double it to form this involution. So this is our doubling trick. It's the same as the doubling trick in the sort of beginning of this talk. We take two copies of each pair of pants. And then at each geodesic, we take sort of one of each copy and then match it up with one of the other set of copies. And as this involution according to this permutation, so that we always have a kind of small bending angle and a shear of nearly one. Okay. So what we've put together, there's no more slides for this part, but what we've put together is we have this immersed surface. It's made out of these immersed pairs of pants. Everything's been matched up, so it has no boundary. It has this very small bending. These shears close to one with very little imaginary part. And then it's a theorem, kind of very similar to the theorem for good pairs of pants being close to perfect. It's a theorem that this surface is kind of nearly an isometric immersion of a perfect panted surface. Okay? And in particular, because it's a nearly isometric immersion, it's pi 1 injective. And that proves the surface subgroup here. Okay, so that's the last slide for this interlude on the surface subgroup there. And then we return to the challenge of getting the exact same number of pants on both sides of every geodesic. So in three dimensions, we have pants all around, and we can pair them off with kind of small bending. But in two dimensions, we have no tolerance for error. We must get the exact same number of pants on both sides of every closed geodesic. And so if we look at all the good pants, we have some error amount. And we want to understand what this error amount is. So we define this boundary operator between rational sums of good pants to rational sums of good curves. And it's just generated by saying, given a pair of pants, you take the formal sum of the three boundary geodesics. Okay? And then the point is that if I have some well, positive integer sum of good pairs of pants, so a kind of multi-set of good pairs of pants, then its formal boundary is zero if and only if there's the same number of pants on both sides of every closed geodesic. And here we have to work with the understanding that if I reverse the orientation of a geodesic, it's the negative of the given geodesic. So if I sum up a geodesic and it's reversed orientation, so this Q gamma epsilon r is kind of formal sums of oriented closed geodesics, where reversing the orientation of a geodesic is exactly the same as negating that geodesic. Okay? And then, given that, this is exactly what we want. We want the boundary 
of our sum of good pants to be zero. So the idea is we can take one of each good pair of pants, and its boundary is not zero, but that boundary of that sum of one of each good pair of pants is close to being zero. So we want to perturb it a little bit. We want to do some kind of perturbation of the sum of pants to get something where the boundary is exactly equal to zero. All right, so this is what I mean by this self-correction. We want to solve this kind of linear algebra problem. So we have this boundary operator from sums of good pants to sums of good curves. And we want to find what I think is known as a pseudo-inverse to this linear operator. So whenever we have a boundary of a sum of good pants, we want this g to serve as a right inverse to alpha. So we can always do that. You can always find such a, a linear transformation from sums from any spe vector space to any other that satisfies this condition for any linear operator like boundary. But we also want, it turns out, some control on the size of this kind of pseudo-inverse to the boundary function. So we want that the size of this kind of uh, pseudo-inverse, sort of how much weight it gives to each pair of pants, is controlled by a polynomial in R times e to the minus R times how much weight you gave to each curve. Okay, so remember, for every curve, there's about e to the R pants that have that curve as boundary. So if I have a curve and then I want to sort of distribute I want to sign this kind of pseudo-inverse, it means that I need kind of total weight on my pants to equal the weight of that curve. So I'm kind of taking the weight of this curve, I'm distributing it over all the pants, which means I can at most divide by e to the minus r, at best divide by e to the minus r, and then I allow some uh, you know, inefficiency in the sense of maybe multiplying by a polynomial times r. But it means that somehow the, the pseudo-inverse is very evenly distributed over all relevant pairs of pants. But anyway, the point is that it's a kind of inverse operator to the boundary operator. It's a linear operator that's an inverse to the boundary operator and for which we have good control over this L infinity bound. So this L infinity norm, of course, is just the uh, maximum weights appearing in the formal sum of curves or pants. Okay, so let's see what this does for us. So suppose we take one of each pair of pants, one of each good pair of pants, we call that pi, and we just let alpha be the boundary of pi, right? Then the L infinity norm of alpha is at most e to the one minus q times r. So we have like e to the r pants having a given gd sigma's boundary, but the number is nearly the same on both sides. <coughs> So when we take the difference between the number on one side and the other side, we get something much smaller than e to the r. And then when we apply this pseudo-inverse, we get something much smaller than 1 on each pair of pants. So we take the difference between 1 of each pair of pants and the pseudo-inverse applied to the boundary, and that's going to be positive. It's weight nearly 1 on each pair of pants. And because the original set of good pants is equidistributed, and we're taking a small permutation, this difference is also equidistributed. But on the other hand, if we take a boundary of this perturbation of one of each pair of pants, we just see that's the boundary of this one of each pair of pants minus boundary g boundary, and that's just equal to zero. Okay, so the effect of this little perturbation is we've got exactly the same number of pants on both sides. So we have a rational sum of pants, but we just cleared denominators. And now we have a in positive integer sum of pants. And we can just assemble it as before. They're equidistributed. So we can assemble it to form a good cover. Okay. So that's, that's the sort of correction theory that we need to finish the proof of the Aaron Price conjecture. So in the last 15 minutes, I want to give some idea of how we construct this function g. Can I ask another question? Yes. Okay. When you say it's positive, does that require work also? That you have to do estimates? Um, 
No, because the idea is that the weight of each pair of pants given by this G uh -huh. is much less than one. But pi has exactly one of each pair of pants. Of each pair of pants. So it's just close to one. The weights are close to one. And right, the point is that it's a small perturbation, so it's still equidistributed. Okay, so we want to construct this function g in the last 15 minutes. We want some idea of constructing this function g. So first, let's define this good pants homology. So we take formal sums of good curves modulo the boundary of sums of good pants. And what's the obstruction? We want to know what's the obstruction to a sum of good curves being the boundary of a sum of good pants. Well, certainly it has to be zero in homology. It has to be the boundary of like a singular sum of pants. So at the very least, this homology, um, it, it, this kind of homology it maps to the good pants homology maps to the standard singular homology on the surface. But we want to prove that actually that the two are identical. And in particular, this map from this guy to this is injective. That's essential. So we want to find a series of identities showing good pants homology as a standard homology. And then we're going to observe that this correction function has been implicitly defined such that um, it satisfies this pseudo-inverse property. Okay? And in fact, not only is it um, a right inverse to the boundary on everything that's a boundary of good pants, it's a right inverse to a boundary on everything that's a boundary in singular homology. Okay? So the idea, I mean, this is a funny thing. We're saying we're going to take, show, for example, that every good curve or every sum of good curves that is zero in singular homology is in fact the boundary of a sum of good pants. And then we're going to go through the proof of that and sort of make everything implicit. Like to say it's a boundary of a sum of good pants, well somehow we had to construct what sum of good pants it is the boundary of. And that sum of good pants is exactly the image of the sum of good curves and by this function g. That's how we're going to define the function g. It's kind of implicitly defined in proving this theorem. And then it's going to satisfy this property. And then you have to go through very carefully and see that this g that you've implicitly defined satisfies the appropriate kind of L infinity bounds. So there's a lot of work to do it, and we're not going to even touch on it in the last 10 minutes. We're just going to talk about the kind of identities used to show that this good pants homology is the same as the standard homology. All right, so the most, the kind of essential lemma is this rather peculiar looking thing. So the idea is these are elements, we fix a point on the surface, and then we look at elements of pi 1 of the surface. And, well, we can take products of that, that's an element of pi 1 of the surface. And then for every such one, there's a kind of associated conjugacy class. And for every such conjugacy class, there's an associated closed geodesic. So this is going to represent the closed geodesic for the conjugacy class of this element of pi 1. And so what this algebraic square lemma says is that if you have four closed curves that you form in this way, you take a0 and a1, b0 and b1, and then this u and this v, and then you look at these four products, and you take this kind of alternating sum of these four products, and you assume that all of these are good curves, and you assume a couple of other things, then this alternating sum will be zero in the good pants homology. Okay, it's a completely non-intuitive statement. But let's look at a picture of it, and then it becomes a little bit clearer. So this are kind of four, this is a schematic diagram. All of these points are the base points of our hyperbolic surface. And then we have two elements of the fundamental group, which we can kind of realize as GD6 segments from the base point to itself. We call that A0 and A1. And likewise, we have this B0 and B1. And we also have this U and this V. So we're looking at four ways of going around. U, and then one of the Bs, and then V, and then one of the A's. 
And our assumption, our kind of geometric assumption we want is that u and v are kind of sufficiently large given the inefficiency of going around on any of these routes. And the inefficiency is kind of the length that you travel compared to the closed geodesic that's homotopic to this. I'll define it like in, in, uh, soon afterwards in another slide. But the point is, if we take this alternating sum of these four closed geodesics, so we think of these as good curves, okay, if we draw this segment, if we draw this segment connecting u and v, the idea is that we now have four pairs of pants. So this pij means you take the bi and the associated, the, the ai and the bj, and then you take this third connection here, and now this is a pair of pants. Like if I take a0 and b1, I have here the kind of skeleton of a pair of pants. Right? I have a closed geodesic in here, a closed geodesic in here, and a closed geodesic corresponding to this whole thing. And that those three geodesics are the boundary of this associated pair of pants. So it's kind of like um, right, if I take just one of these, then I have this pair of pants looking like this. So this is kind of PIJ, where this is say AI and BJ. Okay, and if I look at the boundary of this alternating sum. So I say, here's a curve that goes here, 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 and here. It appears once in the boundary when I throw in B0, and once in a boundary when I throw in B1. But this alternating sum means that the two boundaries cancel out. So that the only boundary of this sum of pairs of pants is just equal to the sum of these four closed curves, this alternating sum of four closed curves. So that's the effect of this kind of minus one to the i plus j, is it cancels out all the other boundaries. So the point is that if the geometry is all right, you have to do a lot of geometry, which I've left out. It's saying that, um, that this alternating sum of good curves is equal to the boundary of this alternating sum of good pants. You have to do the geometry to see that these are indeed good pants. And then it follows that, um, that this is 0 in the good pants homology, because it bounds a sum of good pants. All right, and then, unfortunately, there's a typo. I want this AT to equal 1 half uh, this class T A T bar B minus T A bar T bar B. Okay. So I fix some kind of T. So all of these are elements of the fundamental group, pi 1 of S star, S comma star. And T bar just means the inverse of T. So T is some element of the fundamental group that serves the kind of buffer. And then the point is that each element of the fundamental group A, I can then encode it as a difference between a pair of good curves. So I form this T A T bar, and I kind of fill it in with this B to make it have exactly the right length to be a good curve. And then this algebraic square lemma, if you think about it for a moment, this algebraic square lemma implies that this difference is independent of the choice of B in this good pants homology. So I just need any B to make these good curves. And then I've kind of effectively encoded this element of the fundamental group as a difference of good curves. And then basically what we want to prove is that the encoding of a product is the sum of the encodings. And then we've kind of reduced the fundamental group to an additive thing, which means we've kind of located the obstruction in the singular homology. Okay, that's essentially the idea of what we want to do to prove that the good pants homology is the same as the singular homology. So the main theorem <coughs> is just this statement, that the encoding of a product is the sum of the encodings. So now, in the last five minutes, they promised extra slides, if you've ever seen this talk before. I want to talk just for five minutes about how to prove this kind of statement. 
So it's kind of weird and a little technical, but here it goes. Um, so first, a kind of definition. An essential idea is if we put together elements of the fundamental group, we can think for each element of the fundamental group, we have an associated geodesic segment connecting the base point to itself. And then we could concatenate all of those and form a closed piecewise geodesic. And then we say the inefficiency of that closed piecewise geodesic is the length of that closed piecewise geodesic. It's just the sum of the lengths of the geodesic segments. But then there's an associated closed geodesic that's freely homotopic to it. And we look at the difference between the sum of the lengths and the lengths of that closed geodesic. And that's the inefficiency of the closed piecewise geodesic. And now we want to make our standard assumption we're encoding everything using this T. So T is kind of fixed in this story, given the surface, really. And we want to say T is sufficiently long, given bounds on the inefficiency of the closed piecewise TD6 that are going to appear in all of these statements. Okay? That's our kind of standard G standing TD6 geometric assumption. So our first kind of weird lemma completely unmotivated right here, but it's saying that if you take something that looks like an encoding of these four elements of the fundamental group with T and T bar kind of alternating, that you can do this permutation, you can switch B and D around the other way. Okay, and it's some work to prove this theorem. It's saying that these two closed geodesics, we're assuming that these are both good closed geodesics, we're saying that they're equivalent in this H1 epsilon one. So they're equivalent in this good pants homology. So they're bounding a sum of good pants. And then the application of that is this four part itemization. So it's saying that if you look at this closed curve in the good pants homology, you can write it as a sum of four encodings like this. So it's essentially saying that you can treat the A, B, C, and D independently of each other. As long as they're separated by this buffer element T, then the kind of value of this in the good pants homology is just the sum of four things, each of which depends on only one of these elements of the fundamental group. And the proof actually is fairly simple. We can think of this good curve as a difference of half the difference of it and it's inverse. Here I've just reversed the whole good curve. And then I can rotate this around so it looks almost exactly the same, except here I have A, D, C, and B reversed, and I have D and B in the reverse order. So by our previous lemma, we can interchange the B and the D, and now I have something where all of these guys, I just have A, B, C, and D, and here I have inverse of A, B, that should be an inverse of C, sorry, and D. And then the point is that this like this part here, if I take T, A, T bar, B, and then C and D, and then just made this B, C, D without any bars, but just an A bar here, that would be an encoding of A. And likewise, we sort of get a telescoping sum, so we get an encoding of A plus encodings of B, C, and D. So we can kind of itemize this good curve as a sum of four things. Now we're almost finished. So then there's this thing, if you have a good pair of pants made out of all of these pieces, so again, I'm taking elements of the fundamental group, and I'm kind of putting them together to get longer elements of the fundamental group. I'm taking three elements of the fundamental group, and they form, they kind of generate a pair of pants. And if it's a good pair of pants, and you have the right kind of bounds on inefficiency, T is sufficiently long given the bounds on inefficiency, then the encoding of this part, like this T, R, I, R, I plus 1, T bar. The encoding of that, the sum of these three over I, plus the sum of these three for the S's, is equal to zero in good pants homology. And the point, of course, is that this whole thing bounds, is the boundary. If we take, this, if we take the boundary of the single pair of pants, we get this thing to which we can apply this four-part itemization. And so these elements appear in the four-part itemization, and then these A's appear in the four-part itemization and are canceled out. All right, so this is all, like I said, somewhat technical. 
And then our last slide, if we just look at kind of half of this picture here, like these three R's, if we make one R equal to zero, and then we're left with two others that I rename X and Y, then it's not hard to prove this rather simple statement that the encoding of X, Y using T is equal to the encoding of X plus the encoding of Y, again assuming that we don't have too much inefficiency given the length of T. And this is not quite the end of the story, but it's kind of morally speaking the end of the story. We've reduced this kind of encoding of products to just some sum. And so we've kind of located the obstruction in the singular homology. So that's the complete outline of the proof that the good pants homology is the singular homology, which means that we can kind of realize this explicitly as this correction function, use this to correct the imbalance between pairs of pants, build these good covers, and prove the iron conjecture. So thank you very much for your time. Yes? How, how effective is it in terms of finding the cover? Uh, basically, I think, let's see if I remember this, it's actually quite effective because of the exponential mixing. So another way of saying it is if you fix the two services and then you say how big a cover do we need for a given epsilon, it should be controlled by a polynomial in 1 over epsilon. Because the, the length that you need, this half length, will just grow as the log of epsilon because of exponential mixing. And the number of pants that you then have will grow exponentially in this half length. So it should be controlled by a polynomial in 1 over epsilon. But the whole thing is certainly, in the end, completely constructed. But given, given a particular pair of Riemann surfaces, um, if, you want, if you want to compare, you can't estimate explicitly the, uh, how high the cover has to be. I think we can get some kind of estimate, certainly, because we just need to know, we just need to know kind of the rate of mixing. Essentially, we need to have a good bound on this like counting estimate for connecting the GVC segments, which really just follows us from a good control of the rate of mixing. So in principle, everything can be made kind of completely explicit. Could, could you say again, so G of alpha, its size was something like a polynomial times U to the one of R. Where does the polynomial come from? Why do you get, why is it as small as a polynomial? I haven't, yeah, I haven't begun <laughs> to, to sort of discuss that. Um, I mean, the, the basic, so there's this kind of process of randomization, which I didn't talk about at all. Um, like, so every time you do some construction, every time you kind of prove one of these identities in good pants homology, you maybe need some auxiliary elements. And you want to sort of, rather than choosing one, you want to kind of choose all of them simultaneously and average over all of them. So when I take this third connection here, for this algebraic square lemma, I actually want to take a sort of sum over all of these. And so it means that this error term is kind of almost as evenly distributed as can be. But then, essentially, well, you could add things. So you get some kind of linear um, amount of kind of summation. And actually, it turns out right here, like just to switch this B and this D. There's a T missing, by the way. There's. The bar is there. But There's T A. Oh, so yeah, something's all wrong. Yeah, you're right. The bar. <laughs> you're exactly right. It should be T A T bar D, of course. Yes, T A T bar D. So here, yes. So the point is that if B and D have kind of different lengths, you need to sort of slowly increase one, slowly decrease another. Okay. So you actually need a sort of like R, a sum of R good pants in order to kind of put all of this together. So you get like an R or an R squared. Like this polynomial, if you do everything correctly, it should be something like R squared. Just so the polynomial is like quadratic. Yeah. But we were lazy. I mean, there's one step. It, it, it's, it's kind of technical. But we have to work a little bit harder to prove that it's quadratic. Yeah. But it should be. A priori, it just has degree depending on the surface.
but it's just, yeah, I mean, it's just something that comes up in the arguments of how you're adding up these pants, like sort of how many things you're adding up together. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's kind of an R here, and then you're scaling things down, like you're, you're taking, you, you, you take a good curve, you sort of write it as a sum of two encodings of elements of like half the length R, and then you write that as sums of things half the length, and you keep dividing the length by two, and you need sort of uh, log R steps to do that. And that introduces like some polynomial R number of pants to sort of do the whole thing. Any other questions? Let's thank Jeremy.